Hello everyone, I'm Don Bratton, Manager of Online Learning at the Center for Education Through Exploration at Arizona State University. I specialize in learning design and I'm particularly passionate about science education and interactive learning experiences rooted in active learning. I'm here today to talk with you about our learning design principles, education through exploration. Today, we'll talk a little bit about the background, the need for, and the outcomes of our theory of digital learning design. We'll talk about our primary principle and the practices we use to design our digital learning experiences. We'll take a look at a digital learning experience to see how those design practices are implemented. We'll talk a little bit about the theoretical frameworks that inform learning design and end with a little bit of efficacy data that we've gathered. Our, one of our driving uh, uh, concepts at ETX, uh, kind of our mission statement, is that we must transform learning to embrace exploration of the unknown, not just mastery of what is known at planetary scale. Uh, there's a lot to unpack in this statement. Uh, first, when we live in a world where knowledge is at our fingertips, mastery of the known has less of an impact than it did even 20 years ago, where sitting around the dinner table, somebody who was, in, who was considered to be smart and wise might know a lot of facts about the world. But today, when you can look all of that up, that becomes less important. And what becomes more important is how we use those facts, how we deal with uncertainty, how we deal with uh, uh, inconclusive evidence, how we separate facts from fiction. And that's not something that requires knowledge. It's not, we don't need people who know. What we really need now are explorers, people who can go out to the fringes of what we know, who can shine a little bit of light in the darkness, who can take the knowledge and push us forward. And to that end, we try to model what we call an exploration learning loop. From curiosity, through exploration and discovery, which sparks even more curiosity in this endless cycle. The way we think about this loop is that curiosity is an emotion. Exploration is a skill set and discovery is a result. And we can facilitate each of these. We can spark and inspire the emotion of curiosity. We can teach the skill set of exploration. And we can reward discovery as it happens. So what do we mean by exploration? Well, an explorer asks answerable questions. This might sound a little odd, um, but the meaning of life is not something we're quite ready to, to answer yet. Uh, so we're limited in what we can do as explorers, and we need to understand those limitations. The answers for our questions we need to seek through reasoning, using creative problem solving. And we have to be resilient in the face of challenges. We need to view failure as a learning moment and not as the end. And this is what we desire for, for our outcomes for our students. The way we look to achieve this is through active learning, active problem solving. And this is nothing new, but I do want to draw your attention to a wonderful article uh, in, of all places, the, the journal Nature the same place that Watson and Crick published their findings on DNA. So this is a very prestigious journal in the sciences, not somewhere you'd typically expect to find education research. And what Mitch Waldrop does in his 2015 article is he compares what we know about teaching science to medical ethics. He says, if in medicine we're doing an experiment and we find that a treatment has a positive outcome. In many cases, the study must be stopped and all of the patients have to receive the effective treatment because it would be unethical to continue giving sick people an ineffective treatment. And what Mitch Waldrop's argument here is that with all of the evidence we have around active learning and problem solving and engaging with our students, if we were doctors, our medical boards would be telling us it's unethical to continue to teach 
using methods which we know are ineffective. Now, of course, this is considering the idea of active learning in a vacuum, and we know that there are all sorts of different uh, circumstances um, and restrictions that can keep us from doing active learning and problem solving all the time, but whenever we can, Mitch Waldrop argues, we should. This is nothing new. Um, in fact, this was known in antiquity. Uh, this particular quote is attributed to several folks. Uh, we, we've seen it attributed to Confucius quite frequently. Uh, it seems to be one of the older attributions as well. Uh, but in general, I hear and I forget. I see and I remember. I do and I understand. This relates directly to us as educators because we can tell our students something, of course, whether that makes it to the uh, evaluation or not. Maybe not. Maybe so. Depends on the student. But if we show them something, more students will remember. And when we make them do things, when they have to explore and get in there, that experience helps them understand. And, it, and, and this is not, nothing new in modern history either. It's really the, the foundation of constructivism. However, we've been teaching like this for generations. It started with parents and children, or tutor, individual tutoring. Uh, it starts with that one-on-one -on -one interaction, Socrates with his students. And this is, we know this works, of course, at scale is a different question. But the idea is that when we're one-on-one -on -one like this, we can engage in a process of guided discovery, rooted in problem-based learning and guided inquiry, asking and answering those very same questions that explorers need to ask and answer using the methods that they need, and building understanding from prior knowledge, not in the absence of other knowledge, but constructed atop it. And this is why guided discovery is our primary principle, that tutor guiding you through the problem. Of course, doing this at scale sparks some uh, interesting reactions, um, especially when we talk about online and digital activities. In today's changing world, with uh, concerns about the pandemic and, and instruction transitioning online every, uh, all over the place, um, this can be very daunting. And sometimes, let's transition online turns into a, uh, a recording of a, uh, of a lecture, something passive. You know, let's upload our our, uh, our PowerPoint presentations, our, our slide decks. Let's upload some. Let's find some good videos. Um, and let's let's record some uh, some lectures. Uh, this uh, this is a good first step, but we need to remember that designing for the lecture hall is not like designing for the computer. When we think about 250 students in a lecture hall or 30 students in a K-12 classroom or even 12 students in a small lab section, designing for in-person is not like designing for a computer or a phone. Think for a moment about the way that we handle some of our day-to-day -day correspondence and how different it is from 40 years ago or 50 years ago or 100 years ago when these lectures first came into prominence, these large lecture halls. That, what, that the model we're using is useful, but somewhat outdated in the sense of, in the same sense that, that sending somebody a handwritten letter is still useful, and you still do it from time to time when it's necessary and important and has value. But today, sending an email or a text might replace that, because technology has empowered us with new abilities. And it's that empowerment that leads to the practices that guide our design. Our first practice is conveying authentic science. So what do we mean by that? Well, the first thing we want to do is model, train, and reward scientific habits of mind. One of my favorite inspirations here, of course, is, is Carl Sagan, who would often talk about the importance of being willing to be wrong and to change your mind. And that's a scientific habit of mind that's absolutely critical. We want to mirror 
real world problems and not be limited by disciplinary boundaries. Some of our first courses that we built were dealing with astrobiology, where, well, it's a little bit of physics and a little bit of biology and a little bit of chemistry and there's some math involved. And it's not really a single discipline. You're not going to necessarily find a school of astrobiology like you would or a department of astrobiology. But the real world problems we have don't care about our disciplinary silos. We want to include opportunities for the learner to choose. So, for example, if a student needs to explore four areas, maybe we let them explore them in whatever order they want. Maybe the learner can choose different ways to approach the same problem. Maybe a situation's open-ended and what we're looking at is how the learner deals with the problem and not so much the answer. And we want to connect to the frontiers of knowledge. Uh, I was a former classroom chemistry teacher for a while and one of the things that always bothered me is that we teach titrations, for example, using equipment that hasn't been used in an actual research lab for 50 years, by and large. So why are we using 50, 60, 70 year old methods to train the students who are going to be doing these analyses 10 years from now in the future? Our second major practice is learning as a journey. We talk about ex being explorers and exploration-based learning, and of course that involves a journey. So we think about what motivates our learners, both in the short and in the long term. A course may be motivated in the long term by a big question, like, are we alone in the universe? Or could there be life out there? But maybe in the short term, what our students are looking at as well I don't know if there's life out there, but what's life like here on Earth? Is there anything interesting there? Is there anything weird? And we try and stagger these goals out, just like on a journey. Maybe uh, an explorer is climbing a cliff to get to the top of a mountain, a short-term goal to facilitate the walk. We build opportunities to learn from failure. Failure is an excellent teacher, and yet many of our students fear it. They fear failure. They fear that poor grade. They fear not getting the right answer. And that fear gets in the way of them learning. And so we try and build opportunities to learn from failure in an environment where we encourage the student, hey, that didn't work. Wonder why. Let's figure it out. Let's try again. And we want to assess the journey as well as the outcome. Instead of putting all, all of the weight on the end, on the answer, we want to look at what the student did along the way. Maybe the student made it almost to the end and just something happened and they, they couldn't quite get to the desired outcome. Or maybe they got an outcome we weren't expecting that's even better than what we had planned. Finally, our third practice we call digital by design. We want to take advantage of the unique affordances of digital media. Digital media allows us to do things that aren't possible in reality. I can't shrink myself down to the size of a small molecule and go explore inside somebody's cells, but I can do that digitally. I can't imagine what it would look like, and nor would I live long enough, to see a nebula from a star but I can make that happen in digital media. We want to require action, not just observation. Let's present the student with a scenario. Let them poke around with it. What does it do? How does it respond? Let the student's actions and their observations of the responses dictate the experience. And we want to tutor learners to success through adaptive, personalized feedback. Not just right or wrong, but, oh, that's not quite right. Here's a couple of things you need to look at. Or even something as specific as, you know, I think you multiplied by two there, and you were supposed to multiply by four. We want to give that personalized feedback to, again, help facilitate failure as a learning moment. So I'd like to give you a couple examples from one of our courses, BioBeyond. BioBeyond was conceived as an introductory non-majors biology course at the higher education level. 
It has a lot of parallels and similarities with high school biology, and even dips a little bit into some principles which you're starting to see in middle school now. And one of our, one of the things that we did in BioBeyond was we wanted to take students around to look at life on Earth, because they're looking for life off of Earth. So we wanted to see how did life evolve on Earth. And we took advantage of our virtual field trip technology to create experiences that are impossible in reality. So what's shown here is a screen capture from a virtual field trip that uses spherical images and student-directed navigation to explore an area in the Australian outback. And when I say that certain things are impossible in real life, it's really, really difficult, if not impossible, to take all of your students out for a two-week expedition in the middle of the Australian outback to look at some of the first life to evolve on Earth. So that's where our virtual field trip comes into play. We want the students to do uh, uh, science, not just think about science, not just write about science. We want them to actually go and explore. So for example, we have students go to different sites within this region. We ask the students to uh, not just make observations, but we can actually focus them in on specific areas here. So we want them to look at these rocks like a scientist. And we're starting to get them down that road using scaffolded questions and feedback, like by first saying, how do these rocks look oriented? Are they vertical or are they horizontal? As students dig further into this experience, we have them use a dichotomous key to identify various fossil impressions that exist in these beds. And these are actual images taken at the site um, and, and not something that's constructed. This was from an actual expedition. We even have students at the end build an ecosystem that would lead to the features that we see at this site. And that is how students realize that at one time, this site was underwater, a shallow sea. We use adaptive personalized feedback, in this case, to show students where they need to try again and why they need to try again in this question about rocks. So here we ask the student, what kind of rocks are formed here? The student has selected metamorphic. However, metamorphic rocks are not normally formed in layers. This is something the student would have learned a little earlier in the course, and we're just reminding them of that and then telling them to try again. Here, a student is doing an activity which requires them to drag and drop images and definitions on the appropriate areas. When the student has completed the activity and submits their response, their specific feedback deals with, in this case, sandstone and shale. It's different than what the student would see if they were giving a different response. Again, here we're asking the student, okay, um, when we look at how old life is on Earth, and the student gives us an answer of three and a half million years ago, we actually go into the math involved here. So stegosaurus lived 150 million years ago. We tell them it's about 23 times older. So we give them more specific feedback on the math. The next one, we might even say, hey, all you need to do is take the age of Stegosaurus and multiply by 23. All of this is rooted in learning theories and models. And uh, these, are, these are theories and models that you may have heard of before. They may be somewhat different from ones you've heard of before. And I encourage you to dive deeper into anything that you find that really strikes your fancy out of this today. So I'm going to lay out a roadmap. On the bottom left here, we see an example of a, a standardized test question. Simple four uh, option multiple response. How do we take that, which is what's on our exams, and how do we make it work along with our exploration learning loop? It's not a straight line. First, I want to talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Uh, this is uh, uh, 
common psychological construct that we use to think about where our students are and what they need in order to be able to uh, uh, achieve, in this case, it's listed as self-actualization. But for our purposes, let's say full engagement in the learning experience. We know this as educators, that at the very bottom of the pyramid, the physiological needs, if our students are having trouble getting food, if our students aren't getting rest, if they don't have good, you know, a, good, uh, a good safe home, they're going to struggle in class. If they don't feel secure or safe in school, they're going to struggle. And we know that we can't address all of these areas as educators. But we do need to keep in mind that, we can, that, that what we can address is limited, but still important. Can we help them feel like they belong in the learning experience, feel like they belong in the classroom? Can we give them a feeling of accomplishment and prestige? Can we help them feel secure and safe, even if they fail? So that's step one, is how can we get our students even mentally and emotionally prepared to learn? Then... How do we teach them? This is uh, uh, Gardner's Multiple Intelligences, which has been around since the 80s. Um, but, and then it's seen a lot of different uh, uh, iterations over the decades. In general, though, what Gardner tells us is that we as individuals have different affinities for different int intelligences. This is often conflated with learning styles which is typically described as the way a person learns best. But what Gardner would tell us is that there's no real best. That, for example, I have, I'd like to think I have a pretty high logical mathematical intelligence. I'd like to think that I have a pretty high linguistic intelligence and a pretty high visual spatial intelligence. All three of those appeal to me when I'm learning. I struggle with bodily kinesthetic and musical intelligence. And so I, as a learner, might struggle with a lesson that is solely based upon this. And so when we design our experiences, we want to try and reach as many of these different intelligences as we can, so that students like me aren't left behind by a lesson that's focused solely on bodily kinesthetic or musical intelligence. And students like my wife, for example, aren't lost when we're focusing solely on logical mathematical intelligence. We want to try and reach all of our students. And again, just to reiterate, the, the idea of a learning style, that a student has one way that they want to learn or learn best, it has really been thoroughly debunked. Um, and we do ourselves a disservice if we lean on that or even use the term too much. So once we've realized what we need to do to get our students ready to learn and how to reach them and engage them, then we need to figure out to what depth. Uh, two, uh, often two competing schemas are Webb's depth of knowledge and Bloom's taxonomy. Uh, I use Webb's here uh, solely because it's slightly less utilized and is less systematized often than Bloom's is. Um, Bloom's has great value, as does Webb's. Uh, however, Bloom's is often reduced to a list of verbs or, or statements um, and loses some of its meaning there, in my opinion. And so I tend to lean toward Webb's depth of knowledge. So how do we get the student ready to learn? That's what Maslow tells us. How do we engage the student in their learning? That's what Gardner tells us. How deep do we go and how do we really create a rich learning experience? That's what Webb's tells us. And what we really want to do when we explore is realize that these depths build on each other. That we're not ignoring DOK1. It's important for students to be able to recall knowledge. But that's only the first step in learning. We want to push students into applying that knowledge, thinking creatively with that knowledge, going outside the boundaries of their own mental silos. And so here's our roadmap. I told you it wasn't going to be a straight line. Uh, it takes a little bit of while. Uh, it takes a little while to get there. Um, but as we go through, we can see how by getting our students ready to learn, 
engaging them, and promoting deep learning, we facilitate this exploration learning loop. All of these come together. One of the things we do to make sure that we address these particular uh, differences about our students, when we design, we use a technique called personas. And personas are representations of hypothetical students that we use to test our lessons against. So consider here two students from different areas of the country with different backgrounds, and yet we need to teach both of them about magnets. Our standard here is to develop and use a model to demonstrate magnetic forces. But when we look at our two students, Kamaya and Aaron, Aaron has two very busy parents and a sibling, plays soccer and basketball, loves to play video games. Very different from Kamaya, who has three siblings, lives with, lives with her mom, works two jobs, spends most of her free time watching her siblings, um, and is really interested in travel and culture. With Kamaya, we're going to have to take a different approach than with Aaron, just based upon their background. Or we have to find a way to get both Kamaya and Aaron engaged in the same lesson. Here's an example of a persona that we've built um, and used before. Um, this is uh, a, not a real student, but it was used when we were testing out lessons for a higher education project. So we have a student here whose his biggest thing is he can't concentrate because he's worried about what he'll find at home this weekend. He's, he's so focused on those lower two tiers of Maslow's hierarchy that he can't really get focused on his own education and growth. And that's reflected in what he says. So let's talk about how effective this model is for students like the personas we've looked at, but for real students as well. So here we have data from one institution that used the BioBeyond course and compared it to their original implementation of the course. So here we see that as BioBeyond was implemented, student success rapidly increased and in fact overtook the control. At Miami-Dade College, with the same instructor and same exam, unchanged from before implementation of BioBeyond, we saw a significant increase in student performance just from using BioBeyond, which uses our active learning principles. This isn't just in Miami-Dade, though. Here in Arizona, where I'm at, uh, Glendale Community College used Habitable Worlds, a course similar to BioBeyond, but focused on astrobiology principles, and saw a significant increase in student performance over its predecessor course. The virtual field trips, even on their own, show in high school significant improvements to student understanding and retention, both in the short and the long term. And it's not just our evaluation that shows this. An independent evaluation of BioBeyond by SRI Education showed significant improvements at multiple institutions, especially at Arizona State and Miami-Dade. Thanks again, and please do let the ETX team know if you have any questions.